I'm Stacy Grinsfelder from Blake Hill House. And I'm Devin Caldwell from Our Philly Row. And we're the hosts of True Tales from Old Houses. Hi, Stacey. How are things going? Hey, Devin. Things are good. It's finally summer. We got summer. You got summer after having snow last week? Yeah, exactly. This is how it works where I live. You get 40 degrees, 30 degrees, snow, sleet, rain, one day of like weirdness, and then all of a sudden it's 70 to 80 degrees every day until the end of August. And so we finally did it. We did it. (laughs) It only took a month longer than everybody else, but it's such a weird weather. I, I still can't get over it. I lived here for six years and it still just boggles my mind every year how we're just so sad in May when we get snow and then boom, it's summer weather. You know, it was a bit like that in Seattle when I lived there because the kind of the dreary weather hung on until June and then boom, July 5th of every year it was summer. Never the 4th because it always rained on the 4th. I remember fireworks going up into, into the clouds. But on the 5th of July until around September 15th, it was crystal clear, sunny and dry and the best summer ever. We just take our time getting there. All right. What are you working on at your house? Just real quick. Um, well, I have a blog post that uh, went up this morning. I bought a, I bought a little table. I think I talked about it. It's actually right. an episode. Yeah. We did. So there was a little chest of drawers, like little three little drawers that I'm going to be doing a restoration project to. So that's going to be on the blog today. Good, good. It was a drafting table, if I recall correctly. Yeah, it was. It was. And this is a little tiny, like little tiny flat file or so, if you want to call it that. And um, it's adorable and it's old. And I'm, I'm, re- I'm going to do a restore finish on it. So I'm excited about that. Good. We'll check it out. Uh, here it's staircase, all staircase all the time. And uh, <laughs> I've managed to get the risers primed, getting ready to do some painting. I've separated it, at least list-wise, into teeny tiny little portions because the project is so overwhelmingly large. I'm looking, I'm only focusing right now on the stair risers. That's it. <laughs> uh, but of course, now that the weather's nice, we're also doing some things outdoors Getting the flower beds in order, right? pressure washing stuff, just soaking up that vitamin D. <laughs> That's great. To keep things moving, we do have one announcement. After today, we'll have just one more episode before we wrap up the season, and then we go on a short hiatus. Right. We do it every after every season. We take a few short weeks to get it together, <laughs> right. plan for the next year, plan for the next season, I should say, not the next year. But now that we're nearing the end of the season, we would love it if you would fill out our survey. Now, the survey is something that I wrote last year, and I think it was really valuable. We got your feedback about what you love about the show and what we could do better. In fact, a lot of our listener questions for this season came from that survey, and we were able to create several episodes, actually, based on your requests. We did. We did some West Coast houses. A lot of people wanted to hear from the West Coast contingent. We heard from Amy Havelin from Vivacious Victorian. She was widely requested. So yeah, we, it was kind of fun. We, we based some of this season around those requests. Now, if you filled it out last year, you are welcome, welcome to fill it out again. You can update some of your answers. There's a link to that survey over on the website and also directly on the show notes for today's episode. So, Stacey, it's now time for listener Q&A. We've been sitting on this question for some time. In fact, I don't even remember where it came from. You might, but I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure it was a listener question that we got at the end of last year. Okay. And the question is, if time or money weren't an issue, would you choose to do a whole house renovation at once, a la Fixer Upper, or would you continue to live in your home and take your time renovating as you went? Hmm. Curious about your response here, Mr. Caldwell. Go for it. Well, let me first say to our listeners that Stacy and I don't actually tell each other our answers until we answer the question on the recording time. Yeah. Um, but we can come sometimes guess, and I'm thinking she probably can guess. Um, yeah. I was just going to ask you, do you ever do that? Do you ever think, oh, I bet I know what Stacy's going to say. <laughs> yeah. So I would be of the camp that prefers to live in my house during the renovation and take my time. I think that comes from, well, I'm partly budget. I mean, there is that as- aspect. But even if budget isn't an issue, I have learned that you need to live in your space for at least a year before you do any real serious changes to it. Because all of the grandiose ideas I had when I first got the house and first moved into the house have altered and shifted. They're not 
completely different, but a lot of things have shifted as I've learned more about the house. I've learned how we use the house. Um, and then priorities also, because we've had some priorities that have moved around with changes in, you know, what's going on externally, but also just and how things go about living in the house. How about you? Yeah. That's your whole answer? That pretty much is. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I might surprise you a little. I don't know. And this could be based on, and this actually shifts from season to season. Like I said, it's summer now. So all I really want to do is just go outside and play in the sunshine. (laughs) I don't really want to be bothered with any of this work right now. So (laughs) no, I 100% agree with you about living in a space. Like I can't imagine buying this house and then not living in it and paying a whole crew to renovate it and then moving in. Because I think how I see the house, how we live in the house is so different than how I imagined that we would live in it. Exactly. In that respect, I do think that it's good to take it slow, incrementally see how it works for your house. But where we may differ is that I think I could see myself in a general contractor role And I could see myself getting a crew to do a lot of this work for me rather than me doing all of this work myself. I don't know. We didn't really address that, I guess, from from your side of it. I like to have – actually, you look like you want to say something, so go ahead. Actually, I I agree with you. We are seriously considering hiring out some of the projects I have been planning to do myself just because it would just be easier because things that can be done – that would take me months to do can be done in a week. There's something to be said for speed and that and valuing your time as money. But likewise, I am very particular about how the work gets done. So I'm not willing to just take a hands off approach. Like I'm not willing to change my standards in order to get something done faster. But I can, I mean, there is part of me that would just love to hire somebody to come and paint all my ceilings or you know, just do these little things that are just driving me nuts. And and I honestly wouldn't mind having a window crew. I would be in charge of them, but they could do the things I hate, like taking off paint. I guess it's kind of a hybrid then. Taking it slow, but likewise having a lot more people to help me do the work because it is draining to always live in a construction zone. It is. Six years worth of construction. I have kids that are living through all of this this entire time. And it's just, I would love to have this feel more like home sometimes. And I don't know that we're always there in that. It doesn't always feel like home. It often just feels like my project. I agree completely. And that's actually why we postponed work on our master bedroom and bathroom, because we decided that we were going to hire out at least all of the rough in work and such. And I was going to do the finish work. But with the shift in, you know, what's going on. We don't know what's going on, actually, with this um, economy. Right. We decided that rather than spend the money on it, we're going to wait. And I'm going to do some piecemeal work on it. But that was uh, originally I was going to do all the work. And now I'm like, no, I'm not going to do all the work. It's funny how those priorities shift. It's true. My As my health has shifted, too, I don't have the ability to do as much work as I could. And that's been a new reality for me that's not always easy to swallow. Sure. I think when my kids were little... I liked the idea of the project house, which I had before. We had another project house. And I liked the idea of it more because it really felt like mine after spending hours and hours every day belonging to someone else. You know, the project house was my thing. I got to pick these things. We got to do the work. It was very satisfying. Now that my kids are older, I'm looking at it a different way. And I'm seeing like, oh my gosh, I only have a few more years before they're gone. Do I really want all of those years spent with our house torn upside down where I'm too busy to do things because I have this project house and their lives are just zooming by? I don't know. I've I've given a much longer answer than you have and, and maybe a little bit more philosophical in some ways. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's this time of year, graduating seniors, uh, my kids almost through with college. I, yeah, there's a lot going on here that's making me slightly nostalgic. I, I relate to that. It affects my answer. I'm looking forward to doing more listener questions next season. Now, again, I keep talking about next season, but we do have one more episode this season. It's not over. It's not over. I'm just looking towards the future. But yes, if you have a listener question for Devin and I to answer on air, please submit it right through the True Tales from Old Houses website. (music) 
Today's guest is Terry Wollenweber. He is a decorative plaster restorer, and this interview took place on my field trip to New Albany, Indiana, and Louisville, Kentucky, while you were out on medical leave, Devin. Yeah. And this interview wraps up the field trip series. Before we launch in, let me tell you a little something about Terry. First, he is delightful, truly salt of the earth. And talk about talent. Over on the website, I've already posted the videos and photos that include the decorative plaster restoration that Terry completed at both the Culbertson Mansion and the Emmanuel Baptist Church. I'm going to link to all of that again on the show notes. But what you haven't seen yet is the state of disrepair that that church was in before they hired Terry as part of the restoration crew. It will shock you. I, 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 it's hard to believe how far that church came from completely derelict, giant bits of plaster missing, buckets everywhere to catch the water because it was raining indoors. It was quite a transformation. All right, my name is Terry Woolenweber. I'm from Milan, Indiana. Um, I'm a third generation uh, plasterer and now specialize in decorative plaster work. So funny story about Milan. Am I saying the, the emphasis correctly? Yeah, Milan. Okay, Milan. Milan. I told my husband, I said, you know, fun fact, it's not Milan, Indiana. It's Milan. <laughs> Milan. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's really nice to have you here. I'm really thankful that you were willing to sit down and talk. And this is the last interview we're doing. So you've been very patient. But we've also, we've been all over New Albany. We've been to Louisville, Kentucky. We've had quite a day. Yeah. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And I'm oh. glad you got to see some nice places. Yeah. It's been just a joy. And I really owe a lot of thanks to you and Rhonda for putting this all together. Because it's kind of like having a backstage pass to all of these beautiful places yeah. that we would have normally just maybe driven by. Yeah. I would like to know how you got started. How did you get started with Restoration Plaster? Well, I started with my dad. Okay. In uh, 1972, I was a seventh grader and he went out on his own and I probably should back up a little farther than that sure. because I had two great uncles that were plasterers. Okay. Uh, they'd done a lot of work in Cincinnati. And after the 37 flood, a dad worked for him. He was like a sophomore in high school, and he worked for him in Lawrenceburg, Indiana, after the flood, hanging wood lath and, you know, being a sure. gopher and a, a laborer. And then dad went to World War II, and when he come back, my one uncle went to Chicago and the other one went to Florida. Around home there, there were four, five, six plasters. Mm -hmm. So he went to work for uh, Clarence because he was right there next to his house, you know, close. And he worked with him, and he went to uh, Halcom. Um, Halcom Home Center, which was just a plastering crew at the time in Versailles, Indiana, and worked for them for, I don't know, 10 years probably. What year was this? In the 60s. Okay, so we were, drywall was a thing at that point, right? Started in the 60s. Okay. At least around here. Now, I can't tell you about yeah. up east. I think that's or, about right, yes. Yeah. Um, Maybe slightly earlier east, but. About, yeah. yeah. We're a little later down here. <laughs> um, Take your time. We're all getting to the same place. Yeah, yeah. So uh, dad went out on his own in 72. Okay. And then I started helping him sure. every summer and every Saturday and every Christmas break and because mm -hmm. he wouldn't let me sleep. <laughs> um, and at this point, were you mainly res helping plaster walls, just straight up plaster work? Or at that was... time, I was cleaning floors and oh, okay. mixing. <laughs> what well, um, was your dad doing, though? Was he doing walls? Oh, yeah. He repair? was doing all. Okay. He so doing... we haven't even gotten to the decorative part. No, no, no. Dad had done decorative work, but you got to remember, probably in the late '60s into the '70s, decorative work was out the window. Sure. We dropped the ceilings for the energy crunch down to seven foot ceilings. Right. We was building ranch houses. The only work you done really were like Madison, Indiana, around home, and and Cincinnati, uh, that were big houses that maybe had some water damage from box of gutters, and uh, you would patch that. But as far as running new cornice, um, that wasn't happening. No, I actually was having a then. funny conversation with my friend the other day. We were talking about old houses and the difference between mm. pre-war and post-war, and and that how that all that decorative stuff went out the window. You know, and I pictured these poor builders who were ready to do something so amazing, and the person was like, "Nope, don't put that in. Nope, don't want that. Nope, don't want yeah. that either. <laughs> Make yeah. it as simple and <clears throat> easy as possible. That's all we want." You know? well, it's no different than going from the federal to the you know. Victorian era to sure, the Art sure. Deco. And just, it was just a time in our history, right, and here we just are. It just keeps evolving. Now it's all come back. And, sure. And uh, um, I worked for Dad. Then in 83, I think Dad retired, and I took over the business. 
it was funny. I, I got a call from uh, the sites manager for the state of Indiana, Sonny Ash. He called me. He asked me if I'd be willing to do some eyebrow windows. Mm -hmm. And I said, sure. And he said, well, they're going to be in my house, you know, right. in his cabin. I said, sure. So I went home and I go, Dad, what's an eyebrow window? <laughs> but I told him I could do it. Right, so. right. Um, I like you, too. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have three eyebrow windows on my house. Really? I do. They're not very common. I don't see them very much where I live, certainly. Right. And yeah, it's Well, th through the 70s, it was all ranch houses. Uh, the big tornadoes that come through uh, around here in the 70s, mid-70s, we went up to Sailor Park in Cincinnati, and we'd done 19 houses. Just mm -hmm. all of them looked the same, right. same floor plan. It was all split levels, you know, and it was just kind of boring. But that's... And side by side, <laughs> I lived in a, a government-built house because my dad was a park ranger. All of the houses were mirror images of each other. So you'd have... Everything was exactly the same. The floor plans were the same, but right. they'd be opposite of each other. So ours went one way, my neighbors went the other way, right. and then there'd be two other houses that had the mirror image of right. floor plans. So it's kind of interesting. Now they have different color, different color vinyl siding on. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's the only uh, right. unique factor, right? Right. So you were a plaster. You kind of came into it through your family, but there's another. You had another job, which and we're mostly going to talk about plaster. But I find this really interesting because I have to find out how these two intertwine. But you were a coach. You were a high school coach. Yeah. All uh, right. So where was where did that years. fit in? Yeah, I want to know what sport. Where you were, were you still plastering? So how, oh, how does yeah. that work I've, in? I've plastered uh, 47 years now. Right. So that's been years. ongoing. Yeah. All right. So where did the coaching part fall in there? How did that Well, I started playing. You know, I got out of school. What Graduated sport? in 77. Okay. So I, I was playing softball like all everybody, right. all the guys, you know, mm -hmm. and go out and drink a beer afterwards. Sure. And uh, there was a friend of mine who got in the JCs. It was an organization. All it's right. kind of like the Elks and the Moose so, oh, gotcha. and all that. All right. But it's called the JCs, and they're fundraised for people. Sure. But A service organization. Yeah, they have bowling, and they have all kinds of stuff. Sure. So a friend of mine played some club ball in, at uh, Ball State. So he got together a, a volleyball. So we started playing, beating the ball around a little bit, and that was a lot of fun because sure. – it was more unique around home because nobody, yeah, no, no guys played. Volleyball. Yeah, I was going to say men's volleyball wasn't really a thing. So. Right. Well, in college, you know, oh, you know yes. big, big colleges. Sure. And out in California, of course. Yeah, beach volleyball. That was big. <laughs> it led to one thing or another, and then I started. We started. Another friend of mine moved back from the Air Force from Texas, where he played a lot of USA ball, mm -hmm. and so we started playing that. And the local coach asked me, which. I knew her, and she asked me if I wanted to come in and help out. So I did. I was her JV coach for seven years. For volleyball? For volleyball. And then I took over and was varsity coach for 18 years mm -hmm. at my local high school. Yeah. How was your record? Pretty good record? Yeah, we competed. We, yeah. we, yeah. Always, we always made it, won a few sectionals and uh, three or four conference championships. And uh, we always played somebody that made it to the state tourney. Right. So we played a pretty tight. Yeah, that's great. A pretty great. tough record. That's great. Um, did your daughter play volleyball all through high school? And yeah, both my daughters played through high school. I coached both of them. And my one daughter played for Hanover College, played four years. Right. And that's where we talked earlier. I, I didn't know there were so many colleges right. across the country. <laughs> there's colleges at every exit. So that was basically your side gig, and plastering was your main that, job. Yeah, my <laughs> <laughs> volleyball was my uh, donation. Your donation. Okay. I figured up. I, I coached for 26 years, and that's basically four years out of the month. You don't make any money. Right. Thank you for your service. So yeah. <laughs> so that's about 10 years of my life. I didn't make any money, but yeah, I enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed. I loved the kids. So yeah, I can imagine that. I, I bet you're a pretty good coach. I've well, a supportive and friendly, helpful. Yeah, I like to have teacher. fun. Right. We uh, we I used to always bring them down here to a tournament, and then we'd go to the haunted house here. <laughs> oh, here at the Culbertson. At Mansion. the Culbertson we Man always Mansion. brought them yeah. here, right? And then we stayed at a hotel, mm -hmm. and then the next day they'd all go shopping Funny. on a Sunday. So yeah. yeah. So Stacy, it's that time again. Let's tell everyone about the ways they can support True Tales from Old Houses. The first way you can help is to spread the word. If you know someone who would love this podcast tell them about it and explain how and where to listen. The second way to help us out is to share us on social media. You have friends, you have followers. As you're listening to the episode, take a screenshot and send it to them. Use the hashtag true tales from old houses and please tag Devin and me too. 
The third way you can help is to leave a rating and review wherever you listen to podcasts. We've gotten some really nice reviews lately, and I'm so thankful for that. Uh, Those ratings and reviews help other people find us, and it tells them that the show is worth a listen. Now, finally, over on truetalesfromoldhouses.com, you can make a one-time or reoccurring monthly donation to the show. Rest assured, your donations go directly toward the cost of producing this podcast, and we use it to create more engaging and hopefully useful content, too. As a special thank you, if you donate in the $20 to $25 range or more, we'll send you a coffee mug with the True Tales from Old Houses logo on it. And that's a pretty awesome mug, actually. It is. Now, I have to be honest with you, our company that we're shipping our mugs, they're a little slow right now. So thank you for your patience on that. They're still shipping mugs. People are getting mugs, but it's taking just a wee bit longer than we'd like. Uh, I think that's understandable for our listeners. So we want to thank our listeners from the bottom of our hearts, because without you, there really would be no true tales from old houses. Let's talk about how you went from, or how you moved towards decorative plaster and how you, because now you're services are sought. I mean, people want you to come and, and, and I don't know if this is true, but you probably could have all the work that you, you could handle and, and more if you were available, if you had eight more hands and. (laughs) Well, I'm, I'm spreading out farther. You know, I'm working in Detroit. I'm going to work in New York, um, way down in Kentucky. I've done a lot of work, Mississippi. So, So what was your first decorative plaster restoration job? At the Shrewsbury house in Madison, Indiana. The Shrewsbury Is window. that north of here? That has to be, right? Yeah, a little we're, north. We're Kentucky. We're it's right on the river. <laughs> okay. Uh, Shrewsbury House. My dad and I were there, and I was working for Dad, and we was uh, patching the corners. Box gutters was leaking. Mm-hmm. And uh, Dad sat down on a chair with Mr. Wendell, and they drank coffee. And me and my brother was up at the <laughs> <laughs> at the top. And and, uh, and you were doing cornice we d- at we the done, time. We was patching cornice, yes. Right. That was the very first. And that actually was probably back in the late 70s. And that was my first taste of it. And then when I started doing, uh, I told you about Sonny Ash and the eyebrow windows. Right. He was trying me out at his house Mm -hmm. and then asked me if I'd be willing to travel. So apparently the eyebrow windows turned out okay. (laughs) For not knowing what they were, it worked out all right. Yeah. (laughs) So... uh, it's kind that's of embarrassing good. to say I didn't know what they oh, were. Oh, no, no. I think we've all, you know, you got to fake it till you make it. <laughs> <laughs> so then he asked me if I wanted to come here. And this was the first, the Culbertson Mansion was the first job I'd done here. And this was the 1990s. Is that right? 1990. Okay. So did you tell them, no. oh, yeah, I know how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> no. I, I quit faking my way. <laughs> were you more like, I will, I think I can do that. Yeah, Let's can, give it a try. Yeah, I can, you got to have confidence. That's right. what I always told my volleyball girls. Right. You got to have confidence in yeah. your skill. I feel quite certain I can do this job. I just need the opportunity to try it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really just blown away by this building. It's awesome to get the, the opportunity to work on a building. Right. And so this one's being res- has been restored, I think um, Jessica told us, for 30 years. And you've been a part of this restoration the entire time. Is that correct? Yeah. When I started it, the green flock wallpaper out here on the hallway mm-hmm. and just to see stuff uncovered sure. was it was. So do you feel neat. like you've kind of touched every room in this house in some way? Did every place need a little bit of you? And I've your not services? been on the third floor. Okay, but you probably will be. Or probably, but that's mostly all flat work. Right. But that's, you know, original wallpaper still there, so sure. they might not do a lot to it. Um, there's still medallions to put up and mm-hmm. fix and uh, some corners to work on yet. It's just to be able to work on stuff that other hands had worked on a 100 and some years ago. And I try to do everything back exactly how it was done. Mm-hmm. I don't use drywall compound. I don't use anything like that. I, I use molding plaster like it was uh, uh, originally. Right. So when you go in and you st- you look at a project and you kind of assess what needs to be done, how do you feel at that moment when you first see the amount of work that needs to be done? Is that a feeling like, okay, I've got this, let's get going? Or is it kind of a, ooh, <laughs> this one's going to be a big one? Well, I like the challenge. The church sure. we looked at. Oh, yeah, yeah. We need to go back and talk about that. When I walked in there, that was, I wanted to do it because it was going to be quite a challenge. Right. Then let's talk about that right now because we went earlier to the, it's the Emanuel Baptist Church. And I. Um, Fourth and Breckenridge. Oh, Fourth and Breckenridge in Louisville, Kentucky. And we'll have some video about that. I'll post a link to the building. Well, we're going to have all kinds of pictures. But I had this immediate, it was real, I told you about it. It was like this super strong feeling, just almost overwhelming of, 
the beauty of the place and the history of the place, it just kind of hit me right when I walked into that sanctuary. I've never seen any sort of plaster work quite like that. It was in a state of a lot of disrepair, um, according to Pastor Ben. I don't know if that's what we call him, but right. Ben, who's one of the mm -hmm. pastors there. And and then I saw some pictures that uh, Rhonda, who is also there, has provided. I mean, just giant holes, eight-foot chunks of plaster, eight by 12 feet of plaster missing, uh, flowers missing, crushed. It was. It's hard to even imagine it being in that state. So you said you walked in and you were. Re you thought I want a part of this. Yes, I want. Well, actually, <laughs> it's kind of funny because I'd done a uh, demonstration uh -huh. for uh, the. I think it's AIG. It's Architect Group out okay. of Kentucky, and I done uh, plaster work. Ron had done glass, mm -hmm. and another guy done windows. Mm -hmm. um, Tom Francis. And at this meeting, this architect come up to me. And he says, hey, look at some of these pictures. And it was of the church. Right. And he said this. And I said, well, that's awesome. I said, if you ever, I'll be glad to look at it, come sure. down, because I thought it was pretty cool. Well, two years later, they called. Wow. So it took a while, yes. It took two years right. to, to all this to, to transpire. Sure. And, and uh, yeah, I wanted to be a part of it because it's a challenge to make something back to where it was. And like I told you, Ben was the head of the building committee at the mm -hmm. time. And he said, we just want to look something close to this. Right. And I said, well, if you've got the mold, I mean, if I'm making the molds off the original piece, it'll look just like it. Right. So they were, they were extremely happy with it. And I was, I was happy how it turned out. There's, sure. there's things you look at that I know that I see that we I don't, don't care those. much. Yeah. <laughs> we don't, we don't see those things. I can tell you right now, Terry, nobody's noticing those. <laughs> But I, did, I had to commend Ben. He wasn't able to be on video or any, anything. He was plenty busy with his day-to-day. -day. But I, I did commend him on the fact that he they were looking for a restoration of this building. I mean, it was in such a state of disrepair that right. they were bringing it back. And a lot of people would just think, oh, this is way too far gone. Let's just right. strip a lot of this and not bother with it because right. the, on, the upkeep is just too much. So that's neat. During the bid... I won't say any names. Okay, oh, no, that's fine, during, yeah. During the bidding. We're not here to call anybody out. They had a bid meeting. So there was, I don't know, 10 or 12, maybe 13 of us there, different companies all over all over the country. And uh, we were looking around, water was still running in. They had buckets <laughs> everywhere, and and it was just a mess. So I, I tried to listen. You know, I, I was always told you learn more when you listen. Right. So I'm walking around, I'm listening to what everybody's saying, what they're thinking, you know. So I go up in the balcony, which I kind of knew who different people were. So I was kind of interested in what they had to say. They, we were talking about it, and they said, man, this place is a mess. <laughs> and They didn't know who you were. Didn't have a clue. Okay. And uh, so he's up the top, and he said, well, there's a guy. He works by, his, by himself and got one other person who works with him. He's going to bid on this. What, where we even start? <laughs> And I said, boy, I guess you just start at the top and go down. And be, you were that guy. You I, were that I, one I were guy that who guy. was going to work yeah. from the top down. So that's really funny. So how long did that job take you? Uh, a little over a year and a half. Right. And I was down here seven days a week. So how do you, and this, I don't know, this might be proprietary information, but how do you make a mold? I mean, is it like a silicone mold? And then you're, Take the original. Sure. And then I use two-part rubber and... You pack it in clay if it's a pierced one. And uh, do you ever make parts that just completely fall apart? And you're like, ah, oh, rats! I got to start again. Or have you have enough experience now that that your projects don't fall apart anymore? Well, if I'm making a piece, I, I get a good piece mm -hmm. that it, it isn't water damaged because water and, and plaster just don't mix right. very well. Right. It, it just gets real soft and falls apart. So you got to get a good one, and then you got to clean it up, to get the paint off of it, fix any leaves that's broke or anything like that. So it's a good, nice, clean mold. Um, if you just made a mold over all that paint, it, it'd be a scaly-looking thing. Sure. And you really don't want that. That's the key is trying to find one that one that you can make a nice mold out of. Do you have to strip the paint off to get the... Normally I the, do, yes. All right, I was going to say, you'd have to get to that flat plot. I never even thought about the fact that you wouldn't want to be making a mold of a piece of decorative plaster that had six coats of paint on it because no, it would completely change the shape. A you lot of lose detail the profile. you lose. A Absolutely. lot of detail. Yeah. Of course, uh, any old paint mm -hmm. from the before 70s is full of lead. Sure. So there's a lot of dust. When you got water damage like that, it's real flaky and, yeah. you know, you got to watch your mm -hmm. lead levels. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Do you have those tested every now and then? Yes, I do. Right. Yeah. yeah especially good. down there. Well, you'd have to. I Yeah, I can imagine that for sure when you're always kind of the potential for exposure is great in your line of work. When so. you're there every day 
for 10, 12 hours a day, right? seven days a week. Yeah, my lead level got a little high. Yeah. Does How do you get that? I mean, does it just eventually go down? Just I mean, I know that it's not curable. Uh, do your lead levels go down or is there something oh, yeah. you do? Do you do yeah, chelation or no? They go down. Uh, if it gets up to 50, mm-hmm. supposedly, you're supposed to go in and get yeah. I think it's chelation. blood cleansed or something. Right, I'm not, right. I'm That's a plasterer. I'm not, yeah. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just go in and say, stick me and what's my blood right, what's right. My lead Let level. me know. Let me know if you require yeah. follow-up about this. So. Well, I know... Uh, when Sonny was the head of the state here, if they had, if he was in a... Who's Sonny, by the way? Sonny Ash. He was oh, he was the head of the state uh, historic sites manager. Okay, thank for you. For all the construction sites manager mm-hmm. for all the sites in Indiana. Yes. And uh, they took a close eye on all his workers all the time. Sure. And if they got so high, they'd pull them off a job for a couple of weeks and until they got tested again. Right, right. So they had to watch it. Yeah. You know, I work around or with a lot of do-it-yourselfers, mm-hmm. which is is great. It's These are people who are willing to take a risk and to work on their – but I think sometimes I get a little worried about them because I'm like, don't forget to put your mask on, wear yeah. your gloves, you know, because we you don't think about those things when you're not in a day-to-day job of restoration trades. But the, we're still getting that exposure, so it's so right. important to take care of ourselves. And so you've worked here on and off in this incredible house since the 1990s. Do you just kind of come and go, like as soon as they start a project? And then yeah, they- as they raise money, they decide what they're going to work on next year. Uh-huh. Um, and they get a hold of me. And like the Hill Forest Mansion in Aurora, Indiana, okay, is a small version of something like this. Yes, Decorative plaster is amazing down there, just like this. And they, they call for grants. They write grants. Okay. And then I give them a bid this year, and it, it might be next year before I work on it. Okay, so that's so that's typical. how they. It's yeah. how they, most of it's based on raising money, and many of the jobs I do are like that. Right, right. I bid on them this year. It might be a year or two before I actually they call me. So what do you do in the meantime? You just always have some ongoing jobs. Yeah, I found my niche. I mean, a big company they really can't come into a, a house and do a little water damage. Right. Well, that's my niche. Yeah, that's perfect. For I you. mean, sure. I, I like going. The church was uh, different. Right. I don't want to do another one like that. Yeah, that, that was enough. <laughs> Thank you very that much. Was, <laughs> I'll run a job, I guess. But, sure. Uh, yes, and I could see that you'd have so much valuable experience to help a project like that from start to finish. Right. But it it, it is a lot to. It's a it's a big ask. Right. That's a right. huge project. Right. But so. you got to whatever trade you're in, you got to find a niche that everybody doesn't do. Right. And there's a lot of people that does decorative plaster in the country. I don't think there's a lot of people that has a background. Um, they like to decorate the cake, but they're not sure what the cake's made of. <laughs> right, right. And that's, that's really important because yes. what's underneath is, That's you know, the part that's going to last for the 100 right. years, right? The, Correct. The icing's going to melt and fall right off. Right. It, yeah, especially <laughs> if a cake isn't any yeah. good. So you touched on this earlier, but let's talk about this again a little bit about this idea of working on something that somebody made over a hundred years, years old. Like how I think it's a really special feeling, and you touched on that too. So can you tell me more about like, have you ever had any sort of experiences when you're working where obviously you're just working, you're busy, you're hot because we talked about that. You're up in the ceiling and it's sweltering. But do you ever have kind of moments of of for lack of a better word, like reverence in a way for what you're doing and what you're... Well, a lot of times, the most time you get to think is when I'm doing flat work Mm -hmm. because that's pretty mundane. Right. And describe flat work as a... Just a flat plaster that you're going to apply. Gotcha. uh, Okay. The decorative work to, or if you run a cornice, I mean, you just have time to think. Right. During, and you're thinking of the hands that put it up and how many people it took to do a big job like this. And how they would, you know, how many crews you had flat flat work crews just to done flat work, sure. and you had decorative crews, and just what all those people went through because there was a lot of them right. at that time. They didn't drywall, and this society is so. I want it now. You're only you know? making money if you're working fast, right? That's uh, what you, what you think about. I think when you're up there and you're looking down. I got. To, I had the opportunity to work the Henry Ford Mansion in oh. Dibbon, Michigan. Okay. I got to work in the billiard room to do some decorative work. And to sit there, and I was patching some holes before I put the decorative on, and I was thinking, looking down at the pool table there and thinking of Henry Ford, maybe Thomas Edison, the Dodds brothers, Firestone brothers, walking around and talking about 
their next big adventure. Right, right. Like you were the fly on the wall up yeah. there watching it. That's Just pretty think neat. about what all was said under this medallion. I always wonder, too, if way back then, those people were also thinking about what it might be like for someone 100 years. Like, were they thinking, okay, we're going to build this to last because we want it to last 100 years or, or longer. I use 100 loosely because I'm yes. hopeful that these things will last forever. But I wonder if they had those same thoughts. Um, whether it was just, well, we build it like this because we build it like this, or was it we build it this way because we want to imagine somebody else in a hundred years coming in? I think many there. things were built to last, and they were supposed to be handed down from generation to generation. Right. And I think in this throwaway society we have now, it's I'll keep it a year or two and get rid of it. But it's not multi generational anymore. The house that I live in, the man built it for his daughter as a summer house, and she got married and immediately moved somewhere else. <laughs> and then right. it got passed down. So it was briefly multi generational, but my kids aren't probably going to live there. I mean, that that's it's just right. not the way we live now. Right. Well, just this mansion here, all everybody, every trade had to work together right. tremendously mm-hmm. in a house like this. Your carpenters had to put in the floor joists in the pockets that the bricklayers made for them, you yeah. know, and then go right over top of that. I mean, so everybody had to work pretty much and, you know, get along more than we get along now. Sure. I don't think I've been on some big jobs. I don't like commercial work because one thing I don't like to do things twice and you cover this up and then next day they're tearing it out because they forgot to put something in there. I don't like that. I want to do it no. one time and move on. And the arguing and fighting and hurry up and get done. And I, it's just not my cup right. of tea. Life's too short for all that. Yeah, I'm just imagining this, and not successfully am I imagining this, but I am imagining this is kind of like bare earth and just the vision of let's build this grand house here on this piece of property and watching that unfold. And, and I can I just, I can't really picture how everybody worked together. And What, two years to build it? Yes. And that's... And that doesn't seem long looking at this house. No, but nowadays, if you took two years oh, to yeah. build a house for a customer, mm-hmm. well, they'd get bored and move on. Right, You know, right, they, right. they, they got to have it tomorrow. You also teach the trades. Is yes. that correct? We, I've done some uh, down here in Louisville, up in Detroit, uh, just to give a basic overview of different things. And because a lot of people don't think you can accomplish with the old material. Right. you got to have new stuff. One of the old things was... Plaster is too heavy. The house will sink. Well, I've heard that. And uh, sorry. So they stripped. They stripped all the all the plaster out of the house and oh, hung drywall board. Yeah. I mean, there's so many myths and. I always hear that argument too, and maybe it's valid in some respects. But they say things like, "Oh, those Victorians are the colonial. They would just laugh at all of you restoring this house that way. Like if they had an opportunity to use better, more modern materials, they would have taken that opportunity and." I don't know. I don't know. What do you think? I Well, if I'm restoring a house, I'm going to put it back the way it was. Right. That's what I'm after. Mm-hmm. Now, if I want a reproduction, okay. Yeah. Maybe well, maybe that something. that might be a little different. I mean, but money comes in when you're right. doing it, your old your own house, uh, money becomes a factor. Definitely. Unless you got deep pockets and so you have to cut and pick and choose what you can spend your money on. Right. Money so you're and going time. To get the biggest yeah. your biggest bang out of. Yeah, we we had it when we had our house inspected, they said, you know, it's in pretty good shape. It's just gonna take money and time. And I always think that. All right. So right now I have time and no money. And then right yeah. now I have money and no time. Right, and <laughs> correct. Getting them to line up is really, really hard. Right. So where is this still a family business? You learned from your uncles, from your dad. Is this going to continue on? Are you teaching someone else in your family to carry on this trade? Or is there someone interested? Or? I have a son that's a junior okay. in high school. He Right now, he doesn't have much interest in going to college. Okay. He's got two older sisters. One's in debt. The other one's in yes. debt. And he said, I, I don't want to start out being $50,000 in debt. He wants to farm some, and I farm some. So I think he'll take a kind of a liking to it a little bit. Uh, he's helped me some with molds, and he's helped me some setting up scaffold to church, stuff like that. But he's so busy with soccer and baseball and basketball. Right. He's a high school junior. He's yeah. not thinking about it. Yeah, right. and I totally get that. But in the meantime, you are teaching other young people the preservations trades in order to help them go out, go forth. <laughs> one, one of my things I enjoy the most are probably eighth grade kids. Uh, they're just going into high school. And since we've taken out almost all the any kind of shop class or anything like that for them, to get to show them a little bit about it, it's fun. 
and they get interested about it. And it gives them an idea that there's more things to do. In the Egyptian days, a tradesman was way up here. Sure. And I think we're way down here now. Yeah, I think we devalue it. And I, I think that's unfair. Do you see things turning? I mean, because right now, I think a lot of people are reevaluating college debt. I've noticed that there does seem to be more interest in the preservation trades. And I'm curious if you have noticed that. It's not just the preservation trades. It's just trades. Trades. You right. know, whether you're a welder, a plumber. Mm-hmm. Uh, electrician or HVAC. Yeah, I'm personally trying to get one of my kids to do HVAC. I'm like, you know, that's very lucrative. <laughs> you need, do you need a new furnace? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Air I'm pretty close. <laughs> I'm pretty close. Yeah. I need a plumber too. So maybe that. <laughs> yeah. I think the trades have become, it's made a big swing, a mm-hmm. big push for the trades because sure. they found out there's not enough people. Right, right, right. And I personally am trying to push for for valuing the trades. Well, I appreciate that. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> it takes us all to, to do our part to make everything work. Right. What's your favorite project that you've ever worked on? We're probably sitting here. Mm-hmm. The Culbertson Mansion, Henry Ford Mansion, Fairlane in Dibbert, Michigan. That was because of the who it was. Right. I mean, to get an opportunity to work on something like that. The Hill Forest Mansion in, in Aurora, Indiana. I mean, it's just... Because I get to do all the, the work there, and they trust me. Right. I think that's... That's a good feeling, I'm that, sure. Yeah, they have confidence in me. Well, you must have such a sense of satisfaction. I mean, you must be so proud. You're I probably am. You're probably raised not to act proud, but that must be a good feeling inside I'm, to know you're a part of this. When, when you get... Yes, the whole scheme of things with the decorative... And I work with a decorative painter, and mm-hmm. I work with, uh, you know, the sites manager and the like Jessica's a curator, or uh, right. now she's more than that. But um, to get to work with all those people, and you treat them right, they'll treat you right. I try to be honest, and I don't uh, try to gouge anybody on prices. I right. just... It takes the time it takes, and it requires right. the product it requires. And Right. All right, well, I think we're going to... I'm going to put a lot of these links and things of all the places that we visited on this Incredible trip to Louisville, Kentucky, and New Albany, Indiana. It makes me sad, but we're going to end this whole day of audio and video and social time, and I'm just so grateful well, to you. I thank you for coming all the way down here, and I hope you guys had a great time. Oh, did we ever. And get a little bit of hospitality down here in the Midwest. Absolutely. Yeah, this was our first field trip. I've been wanting to do this for a very long time, and it's been it's been well worth the trip, and I, I don't think we could have picked better people to visit as our first field trip episode. Great. So, I appreciate that. Thank, thank you, you so for, much Thank for you for coming us. down. Oh, so much fun. We want to thank you for listening to today's episode of True Tales from Old Houses. You can find out more about everything we talked about today. The show notes and transcripts are available at truetalesfromoldhouses.com. Until next time. Bye for now.